Hi guys, it's Big Spencer here, and today I'm gonna make Zul's weapon. Now this is the remastered version of the original video. New script, new gameplay. Zul is a character from the Diablo franchise, created by Blizzard. The company itself was founded on the 8th of February 1991 under the name Silicon and Synapse by three graduates of the University of California, Los Angeles. Namely, Michael Morheim, Morheim. Frank Pierce and Alan Ethan. In the beginning they focused on creating game ports for other studios before they would start to create their own games like Rock and Roll Racing and The Lost Vikings. Oh and by the way, the second one is the very first video game I ever played in my life. It's a hard game, believe me. I just can't complete it. <laughs> I mean, I couldn't complete it. I, I can complete it, definitely. Alright, back to Blizzard. In 1994 it became Chaos Studios and then later Blizzard Entertainment Corporation after being acquired by distributor Davidson and Associates. Not too long after getting their true name they created one of the most iconic games and the main game they are known, Warcraft, Orcs and Humans. It was the start of a new era in video games. After the first game, they released several other successful titles that are known worldwide, like Diablo and Starcraft, and besides the sequels to the first Warcraft game. In 2004, they released the game, which became the very exact definition of the MMORPG genre, World of Warcraft. Well, I think we could really go on with the great games the company created, but let's just stick with the ones that are connected to the Blades owner, Zul. There are two games we can mention, Diablo and Heroes of the Storm. Well, Heroes of the Storm is not particularly meaningful in our case, because it's more of just a fun mobile style game, where you can play with your favorite Blizzard King characters, but it's true, most of the people only know the existence of Zul because of that game. So let's start with Diablo. Well, mainly because that's where Zul originates from. The first Diablo game came out in 1996. It didn't contain the class Necromancer, nor the character Zul. Our hero only appears in the second game, bringing the Necromancer class in the game too, which is in my opinion is the coolest of all the Diablo classes. Sadly, in Diablo 3 there is no Necromancer. Well, there is a class, uh, the Witch Doctor, which can summon all sorts of crazy stuff, but not skeletons. Before you start the riot, I know, I know, Blizzard will put the class in the game in the future, but when will that happen? No one knows. Well, maybe there is a date for it, I'm not quite sure. But until then, I guess I have to play the new Hearthstone expansion. I can enjoy the fun of the Warlock killing me with the life plus. Thank you, Blizzard. You made my life so much more colorful. I mean, I like the expansion, but why did that Warlock cut on my list? There were no chance of him winning that game. But no, you had to give him a mind list. Did I already say thank you? Well, if not, let me thank you for losing me that game. Much appreciated. <sighs> anyway, back to the above. I have to talk about the first game, so you get the basic idea of what is going on in the world of Sanctuary. That's what the world of Diablo called Sanctuary. Well, at least the world where the shitty humans live. There are two more worlds, High Heavens and the Burning Heaven. The human world was created by Archangel Inarius and Archdemon Lilith using the world stone, so the angels and demons that didn't want to fight in the internal conflict, that's what the fight between demons and angels are called, can live peacefully together. The children of these demons and angels were called Nephilim, and one of the important ones among them was Rafa, the child of Lilith and Inarius. Everything went fine with the Warzone concealing this pocket dimension, everybody was happy. Except, as it turned out, the children of the angels and demons, the Nephilims, were far more powerful than their parents. So, as you might imagine, some of the angels and demons started to fear them, and the only solution they saw to get rid of this feeling is to eradicate them, while others was of the opinion that they can live peacefully together. Fear is a bad advisor, so the slaughtering of the Nephilim started. But Lilith was driven into a mad frenzy by the threat of her children's extinction. So she started to destroy all the angels and demons in Sanctuary. Inarius saw this and having no other choice he had to banish her to the void. 
But as it turned out, the Nephilim's power started to diminish with every generation, and it reached the point where these creatures became the first mortals of the world, the humans. But the relative peace of this pocket dimension had to end at some point. As soon as the angels and demons became aware of this paradise and the worst of, they started to fight for it. In an attempt to save Sanctuary from being taken, Archangel Tyrell captured three of the Prime Evils, Mephisto, Lord of Hatred, Baal, Lord of Destruction, and Diablo, Lord of Terror. They remained imprisoned until Diablo managed to make contracts with the humans, so he can bring minions from Hell to Sanctuary. And that's where Diablo 1 starts. The hero has to slay all the minions of Hell, and then take the battle to Diablo himself in Hell. After the prime evil's defeat, the hero tries to contain his soul within himself, but he is unable to do so. So Diablo takes over his body, and then he starts the freeing process of the two other brothers of his. And that's where Diablo 2 starts. This is the time when our necromancer enters the story. Necromancer is the name the outsiders gave to the beasts of Ratma. If you remember, I talked about Ratma in this video before. He is an Ephelon, the child of Inarius. Zul and his comrades are a part of this deity's court. They have pale white skin from the solitude lifestyle they live in, and you can consider them bad and good. The only thing they care about is to preserve the balance between order and so it basically means that if the scale is on the side of the good guys, they will start slaughtering them, as long as the bird is involved. But if the scale is on the side of the evil, they will have the people to stop them. And that's what happened in Diablo 2. The scale was on the side of the demons, so the necromancers have to stop Diablo. In the end, everything works out, and we defeat Diablo once again, ending the game Diablo 2. Now we could talk about the third game, but there's no need for that. I think everybody has a basic idea of what kind of guy Zul is, and what kind of world he lives in. And that's enough talking about Blizzard and Zul. Let's jump right into the real weapon section, where we can see what kind of other weapons we can find in reality resembling Zul's dagger. Now, you might notice it, might not, but the blade I made is a short sword and not a dagger. Well, the actual weapon Zul has is a dagger, and I might make a dagger in the future based on this. But no, let's just stick with this sword. I chose to make it into a short sword, uh, because on a lot of concept arts, that weapon is way more wrong than a dagger. So, it looks like a short sword, uh, but it should be a dagger. No, the most resembling real life dagger is the Chris. The Chris is an asymmetrical dagger with a distinctly blade butter achieved through alternating laminations of iron and nickel side also known as Primer. The blade comes from Javanese, and what you can find versions of it in Malaysia, Thailand, Brunei, Singapore and the Philippines. The name Chris itself means to slice, but unlike the meaning of its name, it's not a slicing weapon, it's a stabbing weapon. And because of the wavy style of the blade, it can easily bypass the bones, going right into the organs. And as if it wouldn't do enough the majority, Tiny particles can fall off the blade, infecting the wound, so even though if you are lucky enough to not die from the stab, you can die from infection. What a great weapon design. I mean, you have to admit that, it is perfectly designed for killing everyone that gets stabbed in it. Because of these reasons, Chris-like weapons were considered cruel in Europe. It became the symbol of cruelty, which is a good design for an Ecclesiastes blade. They are already considered cruel. Cruel methods, cruel personal, cruel blade. Perfect! Uh, we have to mention that it was only the symbol of cruelty in Europe. In Javanese and other places, it is considered as the symbol of heroism, authority, etc. Europeans were like, I want to take your land away from you. How cruel you are trying to stop me. Yeah, well, these kinds of blades are not used in wars anymore. They only serve ceremonial purposes now. The other dagger, or knife, I will talk about is called Tekbahu. It's an Aztec sacrificial dagger used to sacrifice humans with. It doesn't have a wavy style and don't really resemble Zul's dagger, so you might ask why the hell do I even mention it? Good question. The reason behind it is necromancers use as sacrifices. I will talk later in this video about what necromancers are, so just be patient and accept the fact they use sacrifices which is done by using a dagger. 
Now back to the Aztecs. The blade has a flint or obsidian knife with a lance blade figure, a double edged blade with elongated ends. The attack pahul was used by Aztec priests to open the chest of the victims of human sacrifice to extract the heart that would feed the gods in the hope that the offerings would bring blessings to mankind. Hands up, baby, hands up! Give me, give me your heart, give me, give me your heart! <laughs> uh, okay. okay, let's just uh, forget what happened a moment ago and uh, continue with the Aztec. The most widespread sacrificial procedure among Aztecs uh, was removal of the heart, cardiectomy. Yep, a brutality confirmed. So, let's just end the story of that knife here and jump to the next section where I will talk about necromancy in general. Necromancy is a supposed practice of magic involving communication with the Dikis either by summoning their spirit as an apparition or raising them bodily for the purpose of uh, divination, imparting the means to for their future events or discover hidden knowledge to bring someone back from the dead or to use the Dickies as a weapon, as the term is sometimes used in a more general sense to refer to black magic or witchcraft. The word itself adapts from the late Latin necromante word, which comes from the ancient Greek necrons, dead body, and the mantia, divination by means of. Early necromancy was related to, and most likely evolved from shamanism which calls upon spirits such as the ghosts of ancestors, but shamanism is a peaceful way of communicating with the spirits, asking for help from them, while necromancy makes the spirits to do what you want them to do, even if it goes against their will, and so it causes lots of pain to them. The oldest literary account of necromancy is found in Homer's Odyssey. The Odyssey's passages contain many descriptive references to necromancy. Rituals, rites must be performed around the pit with fire during nocturnal hours, and other says has to follow a specific receipt, uh, which includes the blood of sacrificial animals to conquer the libation for the ghosts to drink, while he recites prayers to both the gods and gods of the underworld. But rituals can contain lots of things like magic circles, incantations, talismans, wands, etc. Necromancers can be really different from each other, some does the ritual in some kind of basement of a monastery, some eats the flesh of dead persons, but the most brutal ones are used of living humans. Oh and by the way, what I'm talking about right now is the real, not fiction. Necromancy was really widespread in the medieval era, but cases of necromancy happens in the modern era too. Well, in the modern era, if it contains the murder of a living victim, it's only called the ritual murder and not necromancy. But as you could figure out now, it is necromancy most of the time. Uh, for example, in the late 90s, uh, there were a case in Europe where people, a cult, uh, killed people and then used their blood to cook bread, uh, which they ate. So, as much as I would love to say necromancy is a fiction, well, actually, the death summoning and magical stuff is, uh, but the rituals and the other things. Are true, and use nowadays too. Anything that involves the dead spirit or to gain their strength, knowledge, or anything from them is necromancy. But the most common usage of necromancy in the modern era are seances. Seance is a way to communicate with spirits, and while it's uh, not considered as necromancy, because when someone says necromancy, everyone thinks of some batch of crazy stuff, uh, but it's not always is. Sometimes a simple sense is necromancy. When you ask the spirits to do some kind of stuff for you, give you information about something, or tell you what kind of future events you will occur. But summoning ghosts can be dangerous. If you can't control the summoned ghosts, you can end up dead pretty easily. Well, not like if it can happen in real life. But in several horror movies, and that's the case. Just don't try to summon anything. How hard is that to understand? Jeez. And that marks the end of this episode. Thank you very much for watching. Subscribe if you like the video. Leave a like. Comment. See you next time. And now let's the fun part begin.